10 years ago, that kind of conversation was, oh, you know, we will be at the head of the curve if we have mm. a diverse workforce. Now it's, if we don't have a diverse workforce, we won't be on the curve because Agreed. we won't exist. Yeah, I, I really like our that. our competitors have got diverse teams working on diverse projects and working on making sure that people in certain areas just, you know, are now represented and are engaged. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third Diversifying Data podcast. I am your host, Raki Sharma, and today with me, I have two friends and colleagues. Um, first of all, Joseph Woodman, who does go by Joe, and he's going to kill me for calling oh, him Joseph. How dare you. <laughs> and also, Sonal Sethi, uh, who is a consultant currently on client site, but um, has become a very good friend of mine as well. So thank you both for being here on the podcast today. We are going to dive into your personal journeys, your experiences within uh, different scenarios at work and in your personal life and what diversity means to both of you. But I want to kind of kick this off slightly differently because I know both of you personally, but let's get into like a fun fact about both of you that people wouldn't know. I'll, I'll kick yeah. off. Yeah, Joe, you kick off. Uh, I once sang at the proms. In fact, I've sung two or three times at the proms. That's very very cool very cool you do music yeah yeah it's wow. super great <laughs> we haven't discussed that so <laughs> <laughs> no um oh my gosh okay that's a fun fact how are you my my fun fact is in relation to music i write songs awesome. and i sing and you know perform them do the production for it and yeah but my main thing is songwriting that's like yeah favorite thing and i have almost no discernible music talent so this <laughs> is a really great mix that we have in the studio today rocky's like i listen to music i do i do <laughs> i have a very eclectic music taste we can we can get into that in a different <laughs> podcast um so first of all i would like to start off with you joe mm -hmm. what is um your current position and and how did you get there just tell us a little bit about your journey yeah 100 so i am the client analytics and strategy consultant for cooper group which is a fancy way of saying that I do uh, a lot of the strategy and a lot of the sort of dashboards analytics for anything around the sales function. Uh, so I work for Simon Walker, the managing partner of Kubrick. Uh, I've been working with him since May of last year. Uh, before that, I was in training. I trained as a data product consultant uh, for four months. And before that, I was a researcher for about four months for both Tim and Simon, the managing partners of Kubrick. Uh, and yeah, and came straight from university, did a master's degree in intelligence and an, uh, an undergraduate degree in international relations. So very non-STEM, very politics, very boring books and things like that. And sort of quite a quite a hefty career change. I was going to gonna uh, say, he hefty career change, but that is, that. that's pretty phenomenal to come from a master's in intelligence. Mm. I've never heard that. That sounds so cool. <laughs> he could technically be working for the CIA at the same time. <laughs> we don't know. Um, but no, that's, that's an incredible, incredible journey. And we'll, we'll dive into the specifics of it in a little bit. Um, Sonal, would you give us a little... Yeah. overview career wise of course so similar to joe i don't have a background in data at all my background is my degree is international business management mm -hmm. i graduated in 2020 which is obviously like when covid happened and everyone you know graduations all got stopped um before then I had, I, my A-levels were, you know, geography, economics of business and maths. So again, not data really, but I feel like I had always swayed towards the business side. So I always yeah. wanted to work in a business, always wanted to work, you know, in a, in a multinational organization. Um, I just didn't know which one at all. And then basically after that, I, I kind of started looking for jobs and that's when I found Kubrick. Do you know what? This is really interesting because of all, uh, of all the guests that we've had on so far, it has been a very running theme of doing really great degrees. And then it's this factor of, I don't really know what my next move is. So data is is something that's been banded around. I think now it's become much more of a known industry. Before it was just this sort of topical word that people used, banded about, or all companies need to access good data. How did both of you make that segue from, I've done a master's in intelligence, <laughs> international business management. I wanna work in data, buzzword of the, of the day. I found my degrees really interesting and I found like the topics and, and, and things like that and, and just the understanding of the world space was mm. really, really exciting to me and, you know, really great lecturers, really great uh, group of group of friends from university. But there, as you said, there was there wasn't really a sort of firm career direction that I found particularly interesting. Um, and what I've actually 
had known for a long time was that I found sort of the the technology space really exciting. Now, when I picked my GCSEs many, many years ago, uh, and I actually did it a year before most people do, just the way my school did. I was like, I was 12 or something. And I what? didn't pick. That was like yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't yeah. pick what computer What schools science. did both of you go to? <laughs> my my school decided to do a three-year GCSE rather than a two-year GCSE. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, but yeah, so I, I, I didn't pick computer science. Right. Um, just, you know, I, my IT t- teacher was great, but I just didn't really feel the, the need for it mm-hmm. back in not to age myself but 2008 <laughs> whenever i made that everyone decision. can google backwards and go. find out joe's age <laughs> um but no so i uh yeah so I, di- I didn't pick it and then obviously that that door almost gets shut off for you at that yeah. point and so i get into my a levels i still can't choose it i go to my degree and i still can't choose it but i know that i'm interested in technology and i know that technology is the space to be in mm. and so thankfully i sort of stumbled upon kubrick and went oh this could be my door this could be the way to get into right. into that space and then applied went through all of the yeah yeah, the, the hefty application process. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, here I am. That's amazing. Sonal, same question. So for me, I kind of always wanted to do something in technology, but that door was never opened for me. Yeah. You know, I went to a grammar school, which was ironically an, an engineering grammar school, but they didn't offer software engineering or any kind of, you know, computing A-level. Even They didn't even do IT as an A-level. It was you do ICT, ICT yeah. for, um, for like your GCSEs and then that's it. And it's it's such a shame because, you know, it's something I definitely wanted to pick up, but I just think, I think now they do offer it, but I think I was that the age group where it just wasn't, it wasn't a thing, you know, you yeah. just, you don't learn that there's computer science available. You don't get to do things like that. And I, I actually ended up going around to different universities to try and find out if I could apply, but they all wanted, you know, either maths and physics or maths and computing. And I was like, well, I have maths mm. and geography and yeah. business with economics. So, you know, I couldn't get into it that way. Um, but what I ended up doing at uni is going to computing lectures, which is, I don't, I, I don't know what composed me to think to do this, but I just decided, I was like, you know what? I have friends that are learning this. Yeah. I'm just gonna go sit with them in my like one hour that I have uh, between my business lectures and go and talk to them and, you know, like learn from, basically learn in their lectures. And I did tell the lecturers, you yeah, because obviously not paying for it, etc. but you know. So after uni, I then wanted to look at, you know, maybe doing a master's degree in computer science or just something to get in the technology space. Yeah. There was nothing. There was literally, I couldn't get anywhere with not having the experience already. And it, it was so annoying. Um, and then I started applying for jobs. And Kubrick was one of three places essentially that I really, you know, put my heart into. Yeah. Um, the other two were for kind of software engineering roles or, you know, just technology roles in general. Do you feel like, for example, both of you have talked about a lack of accessibility. Mm. That is a point that that comes into play even when we you know even before we get into the diversity piece and how important it is accessibility is one of the the key factors that stops people Mm -hmm. from moving forward in a certain direction because they they're just like it's too far-fetched it's too out there i don't have any access to information was there an element of i guess self-starting for both of you did you have to go and research things yourself um did you feel like there was a lack of access at the beginning versus now what people have access to yeah no yeah i I, i'd say so um sort of when i was looking at at jobs etc i applied to many jobs uh in my (laughs) master's degree thank god because everyone else in this huge number no honestly everyone in this this podcast said i applied put all my eggs in one basket came to kubrick i like a very realistic Uh, angle to this story hundreds (laughs) thank you uh, yeah probably yeah covid was happening there wasn't much going on right 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 right. these are your options right got it and uh, but you know and and i knew i knew that i wanted to be in the technical space Mm -hmm. in some description um you know i'd i'd engaged in the technical space as a consumer Mm -hmm. and i'd engaged in the technical space as a you know a podcast listener uh i won't i won't plug any other podcasts on this uh, one but, please, please don't <laughs> no. um but you know that kind of like engaged it as a consumer but not as a as a and as a user but not as like a creator and not yeah. as a as, as a developer and so i yeah i did that the classic sort of let's go and watch a youtube video for right. three hours on the fundamentals of sql or things like that and some of them are really useful and some of them are really good but they're very isolated and they're very clean and they're very orchestrated and you know this is the perfect data set and this is built this is how you build the view to do this and that yeah. kind of thing and yeah. you know as we all know the the space in the, the the real world environment just isn't that clean and isn't that tight and, yeah and uh and so there was and i think actually that's what 
uh, when I was applying to you know roles in the tech space, that's what people were looking for. Yeah, is that great? You can sit for five hours or do a a week long course um, online, but you need that kind of experience of you know entering into a space that isn't as clean and as tidy and yeah. as sorted as that kind of thing. And that's what you know Kubrick gives. Got it. Got it. Well, I will move on. I think to the 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 reason that why why we're all here today is to discuss individually and hear from you both individually about what diversity means, not only within this industry, although it is good to highlight that within this particular industry, but yeah, what does diversity and inclusion mean to both of you? Sonal, I'll start with you. So I think for me, it's just, it's really important because I just think that we don't live in a world that's diverse enough. Mm. It's crazy because we're, it's 2021 and we talk about things like this, you know, there's great initiatives in companies, but you're, you're working in companies and you're actually thinking, is this as diverse as what we can get? You know, can we get different people? And it's not necessarily just culturally diverse, but you know, I'm talking education, I'm talking different backgrounds, people who have been through different experiences, career changes, you know, diversity is in so many different forms. And I think that's why it's so important because I, you know, I'm a diverse individual. Um, I'm Indian in my cultural background. I have not come from a STEM degree, you know, nothing to do with data. So that's, you know, my education diversity. Um, And I just think when you've got diverse individuals, you're able to kind of create more unique ideas and kind of come up with unique blends of, you know, teams who are actually going to be able to produce new and innovative like results. Yeah. And without that, companies aren't going to move forward. And I think they are realizing it's Mm -hmm. just and I do think companies are, you know, I do think businesses are making efforts. It's just there needs to be more efforts and yeah. a little faster, but it's yeah. not you, an ideal world. Exactly. I mean, do you feel like it's very um, niche in particularly your client because mm. you're working on client site? Do you see it happening? Because you said it is happening. Mm. So we can attest to the fact that it is happening. Companies are jumping in on the fact that it needs to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, is it happening within just your team that you're seeing it? Is it happening company wide? You know, how how vast is, is that diversity agenda being pushed? I think it is company wide, which is really lovely. I think, you know, um, the company that I work for, they essentially within their values is diversity. And I think if you put, put it at that level, but you kind of make sure it trickles down by incorporating different initiatives, you yeah. know, having diversity weeks, having, you know, diversity initiatives through HR and talent pool resources, things like that. That's how you're going to get the diversity yeah. out. So I'm really lucky in the sense that the company that I'm working for, you know, an asset manager is incorporating diversity in that as a key value Mm -hmm. um, on a top higher level. And that's why it's being able to, you know, trickle down. That's a a really interesting point. Joe. in in the same vein for you, what does diversity and inclusion mean to you personally? And then talk, I guess, about Kubrick as a company and and what that is. Yeah, 100 percent. So from my perspective, I mean, it's it's all of the things that we all know. You know yeah. what I mean? Like having a diverse team, having a uh, being able to have diverse points of view, being able to inf- affect you know huge any, anything in the along the product journey or along any kind of thing. Yeah, uh, gives you just that ability to to yeah just do better basically. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the nice thing that we're now getting into just in the in the whole uh, sort of corporate business space yeah. is that you know ten years ago people were talking about diversity and the people who were championing diversity were saying not only is this good for humanity and this is good for society, but right. it's also good for you. Yeah. It's so important. If you have a diverse workforce, you can mirror that diverse, the diversity of society. You can have bring in different ideas, different cultures, different viewpoints that allow your products or your businesses or your projects to just take off and be way better than, you know, what they are in a whitewashed, homogenized environment. Yeah. Just like six blokes sitting around. A, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which we do still see. It's, you know, no, we, 100%. Yeah, we and, do still see, but I, I understand the point. I feel we're now entering, you know, 10 years ago, that kind of conversation was, oh, you know, we will be at the head of the curve if we have mm. a diverse workforce. Now it's, if we don't have a diverse workforce, we won't be on the curve because Agreed. we won't exist. Yeah, I, I really like our that. our competitors have got diverse teams working on diverse projects and working on making sure that the customers and the customer centricity of it now means that, you know, these these people in certain areas just, you know, are now represented and are engaged, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that, that, that's, that's my perspective on it. The important thing from my perspective as well is to make sure that, you know, it's not that kind of like one, uh, brush fits all exactly. kind of diversity yeah. perspective. Yeah. So I, I'm LGBT. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's in itself a diversity corner. Yeah. Um, but I'm also conscious of the fact that, you know, I'm also 
a white man and so therefore have a lot more privilege in certain places than, than others yeah. so it's a quite it's important to be able to identify and go through that journey of going you know oh i'm now a diverse workforce because i've got you know 50 percent women 50 percent men a but statistic there's that rather statistic than anything, yeah. rather than an actual and yeah. that's that's the thing that I'm, I'm really keen on and and i think we we at kubrick are now sort of entering into that space where mm -hmm. you know we've always thought of ourselves as diversity champions yeah. uh, and to a degree we you know we always have been mm -hmm. um you know comparing ourselves to the the tech space which as we all know isn't the best yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> but but now we're now getting into the conversations where you know you know I'm, and i'm sure yeah i'm sure that our uh our leaders would agree, you know, they did at some points get to that point where it's just a statistic. It's, you know, here's the gender split. Here we are. Yeah. Uh, but now we're having, you know, serious conversations throughout the business about, no, no, it's not just that. And it's not, it's, it's making sure that we work best for our, our, um, our consultants and that, yeah. the people who work for us. It's making sure that we promote ourselves as the sort of bulwark, like the, you know, the, the, the perfect example, mm. um, for, for diversity so that we can sort of help our clients and engage our clients in a, in a positive way. I think that's, so, that's so brilliantly put because that's championing who the person is in an individual. And just to kind of further on that point, I guess I have always been someone who, you know, wants to as much as possible, not shine a light on the things that make me different. You want to do a good job, but you know, sometimes in your mind, you want to separate work from personal life and you make a concerted effort to say okay I've got to come in and perform and that's an element of diversity that I don't think people tap into is that people work differently people have high fun functioning anxiety depression uh dyslexia ADHD all of these different elements of diversity that don't come down to your um you know your your gender or your culture in terms of you know religion or anything like that do you feel like you are comfortable, especially touching on the LGBTQ side of things? Um, do you feel comfortable vocalizing that in a public setting now? And how, how does how's that been? Yeah, so I mean, it was a journey. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I've I've known for for a long time that I'm LGBTQ. Um, sort of, you know, eleven years old, twelve years old, and those those kind of you know early days. Um, but you know, I didn't come out until I was twenty, wow. probably. Okay. Um, and it was, and it was. It's it's a weird situation because you know uh, my immediate society isn't is, is is completely you know open and free and you know calm and nice and you know full of nice people. I, I wasn't ever worried that I'd be sort of ostracized from my immediate like friends and family. Yeah. Um, but there was still just that pressure and that kind of just like that high end sort of like do you mention this? Is yeah. this something that you can you can even like risk talking about? And it comes from you know I was ten years old being called rude words and on right. the playground because that's just what you were done you did when you were 10 years old and you yeah. know I, I probably said the same thing yeah. you, you, do you know what i mean you, yeah you, you build into that kind of that mentality and and it's one of those nice things that um that i now get to be a little bit more open about you know i talk about it um uh much more uh, openly now uh, and actually kubrick's phenomenal about it i remember um Christmas party many years ago, uh, where where Simon and I. Oh, what Simon, is it? Sorry, I have to say, what is a Christmas party now? Very, because very now true. we're in COVID. I've just my mind's very, gone blank. The 2019 Christmas party, Cooper Christmas party. But I, you know, I had a long, long conversation with Simon about it, um, and it was really sort of freeing, you know. Yeah. And it wasn't it wasn't something I was hiding, but it was also something that I didn't talk about. And I, I'm a, I'm a fan of of um, you know, there, there is there is a space for uh, your personal life and your work life and and it's important to make sure that if something happens in one it doesn't truly negatively affect the other one yeah. if you see what i'm saying yeah but in my opinion there's a big sort of gray zone in between where you know i don't i i don't like you know sort of clocking in clocking out and being a different person yeah from 8 30 to 5 30 that i am from before 8 30 and and after 5 30 mm -hmm. and i like to be able to sit down and have you know meaningful relationships with my colleagues and yeah. being able to sit there and talk and go oh i'm taking my boyfriend to birmingham this weekend mm -hmm. and that just to be a something that i could just sort of flows off the tongue so what's your experience been like in terms of that is there anything you can speak to on that I think in terms of like, even prior to COVID, there were so many people who I know personally, even myself and even, you know, throughout uni that suffered with anxiety. And it was just this kind of taboo topic genuinely. And it's it's crazy because I graduated in 2020, as I mentioned. So it's not even, it was last year. Yeah. <laughs> it's not even. God, my graduation <laughs> seems like 20 years ago compared Gosh. to you. <laughs> it was literally, it's not even that long ago, but I think over, over COVID, kind of in a blessing and a curse, it's been, 
spoken about a lot more now. I yeah. think companies are becoming a lot more supportive. Um, people are becoming, I, I would, I want to say braver bringing these topics up by saying, you know, having these difficult conversations with their workers and with their managers to say, this is what I'm going through at the moment. I might need a day. And I think, you know, Kubrick offers mental health days, which I think is so important because, you know, as you said, it's not just physically worn out. If you're mentally worn out, that can be really damaging to an individual. And, you know, besides obviously the work suffering them because you're not necessarily in the correct headspace, mm -hmm. no one wants an, a culture or employees that are feeling so miserable 24 seven and then coming to work because they have to be there. They feel like there's no escape, there's no kind of way out. They want people who feel comfortable, who feel supported. And I have seen in you know, the 10 weeks that I've been on my clients so far, I've seen such tremendous support for people, you know, who who bring this topic up, you know, say I suffer with anxiety or or people who don't and just say I, I need a day. Yeah. And I think that's so wonderful and I think it's so important because, you know, only when those employees feel supportive are they going to, are they actually going to produce the best work, you know, yeah. because they want to work, they want to be there, they want to do the job that they're doing. And yeah. Even homeworking to an extent, you know, there's obviously pros and cons to both going into the office and, you know, working from home, but yeah. kind of having a flexible work life, just if you're not feeling 100% one day, without kind of feeling, I can't explain the pressure or, you know, I've only been in a client for 10 days and I, uh, not 10 days, sorry, <laughs> uh, 10 just, weeks. Yeah, just, just to reference, she has been on client side for 10 <laughs> for weeks. 10 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's crazy because I've, I've been so lucky, I've not experienced, you know, feeling boxed in because if I do need to work from home, I can work from home. But it's having those conversations and bringing light to the subject of, people every single day are dealing with anxiety on you know acute levels and very large levels mm. as well and people who haven't necessarily dealt with it before in terms of the uh, diversity and inclusion piece especially now you know it's it's very data centric what both of you are doing mm. um what are some ways because i i think that the industry that we're in is fantastic it is the it is the future it's it's not only the future it's the present it's mm -hmm. what we're working in right now it's what people have to understand is how to work more data centric and how to work effectively under different conditions that maybe that they haven't been. So you've got to be adaptable to a degree. Um, what are some ways that we can, I guess, encourage diverse applications, encourage people from, you know, who have been away from work potentially for years to come back and learn these new skills? Are, is there anything that you think that we could do to help people? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I, I think it's, it's, it's breaking down the sort of cultural norms hmm. that are currently locking out like perfectly um, like yeah, brilliant applicants yep. from even considering there's a piece around unlocking the potential of individuals who wouldn't necessarily fall into the, the sort of ideal candidate in a current process. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the reasons why I liked Kubrick and I applied to Kubrick was because I could apply to Kubrick because mm -hmm. I didn't need a STEM degree to be able to get into to Kubrick. Um, but that that can be said and, and extrapolated across the whole industry and the, across mm. the whole space and and being able to um, give people that kind of doorway and, and not sort of looking at them and going, you know, oh, you know, you've been out of work for five years, so I'm not going to consider you or, oh, no, you haven't got this qualification or that qualification. Right. You know, we almost entered into about five, ten years ago, entered into this space where lots of people were getting degrees, they're becoming more and more specialized. And because they're becoming more and more specialized, the companies that are hiring from them are looking for those degrees because more people have them and more people have the specifics that they want. Yeah. Um, but then in doing so, you sort of force yourself into a, a diversity problem and, a, and a, an understanding problem because yeah. you're sitting there hiring copycats of the people you hired a year ago and the yeah. people who hired years, you know, years before. Um, and so what, what you've, you know, it, it's that kind of conversation that, that talent teams and senior teams across like the whole space need to be having that conversation of, well, you know, do we need to hire uh, somebody with a business degree yeah. to do this junior business role? Yeah, probably not. Probably you could do any, you know, you could take and there will be people who want to do that from the business perspective. You know, you don't want to cut those people out, but yeah. you also want to widen that that space up so that, that you know, that person with a, an arts degree could come in or that person with or, or even that person who's, you know, been out of work for five years or that person who is just finishing um, uh, secondary school and doesn't want to go to university. Yeah. And having those kind of conversations across your whole p talent pipeline 
just builds up that sort of long-term thinking. Because, you know, as you said, we're getting to the point that we're um, sort of a uh, employer-led industry. Yeah. You know, if your cl- if your company doesn't like the way that you want to work, you will leave. You know, yeah. we're, we're currently in a, uh, right, right now, we're in a, a glut of people leaving industry, li- leaving jobs and leaving companies that they don't like. So companies need to like look to their employers and mm-hmm. trying to make, tr- trying to make their offering as good for them as possible. And yeah. we're now starting to see that, which is very cool. That's amazing. I mean, I completely agree with that. And I'd never thought of it from the talent and resourcing perspective. I think, you know, I, I always sort of champion the culture of diversity and, you know, for, for a fact that I'm able to host or co-host a podcast is, is an incredible thing. I never thought I'd have the opportunity. I don't have any sort of experience doing things like this. So it's opening up the barriers to entry. But I think also you're right from a talent perspective and a sourcing perspective, that definitely needs to be considered. And, you know, I wanted to say, for both of you as well, you you come from both very diverse um, backgrounds. Is it important to you to see people that look like you in whatever capacity that might maybe sexual orientation or cultural backgrounds? Is that and is that something that you look at when you're considering a career? Is that something that you look to, you would like to see more of, or are you happy just to see people championing the general idea of lowering barriers to entry, diversity? Um, so f- for me, I uh, ve- very much so, yeah. very much something that I um, I really keep on top of, um, uh, and 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 like to sort of not just see the kind of you know it's it's so important to have the um, the sort of top level conversations and the top level kind of like we champion diversity and, and seeing the senior leaders and seeing you know senior members of of a company sort of ex- saying those views. Yeah. But equally, it's important to see what that looks like going down, whether mm. that does manage to sort of sort of feed down into the wider workforce. I'm always a big fan of Monzo um, and their sort of diversity initiatives and their div- diversity reporting. Mm. They're a big um, sort of LGBTQ hiring like company uh, and I know a couple of people my friends of mine who work for them and yep. the sort of they talk about how it's not just you know lip service lip service yeah it's a it's a whole sort of you know it feeds down into their talent process it feeds down into that and that breeds that kind of like success yes. you know yeah. what I mean like um being able to sort of turn around and go this is the you know this the state of play is phenomenal I I we we at Kubrick did a big uh sort of um oh, it was really a, a data collection um process but in trying to understand like the diversity of our employees because you know we were collecting some information but not that much information yeah. and i saw the sort of preliminary information about that a couple of weeks ago um and it was was shocked uh, in in a good way mm. by the lgbtq representation the sort of um the gender understanding you yeah. know the the uh, ethnicity space and i was just like actually you know we talk about diversity as an important thing and we talk about and, and, and ironically, I'm going to sort of flip it on his head and go, it's great to talk about that, but it's also great to see the statistic. Yeah. And to, for me to know that I'm a member of that like yeah. group and I'm not on my own and I'm not there, I, you know. Championing it by championing yourself. Yeah, exactly. that's amazing. So I know for you, is it important for you to see, repre- to visually see mm. representation as, mu- as much as you yeah. see it being, being spoken about in your no, company? of course, of course. I mean, you know, speaking about it is amazing. And I, growing up, I attended things like Women in Data, IT is not just for the boys and things like that, that were really important to me. But I think not only is it important to see people already there who you can obviously look up to, yeah. but I think it's important to let younger people know these kind of things right because I don't actually think there's enough being done for the younger generations to understand that you can get into data you can get into the technology industry mm-hmm. um if you're different and you know let's be honest I think most people are different like, yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. diversity is so well well spread in the sense that it's it's actually hard not to come from a di- you know not to have some element of diversity and absolutely I think there's so much like almost like a stigma around the idea of oh well tech I didn't, I didn't go down the tech pathway, so I can't, I can't enter it. And, yeah. You know, speaking to what Joe, what you mentioned earlier, when I applied to Kubrick, the only, the other main company I applied to, similar in the sense that said, you know, you don't need any experience, we will train you. And I was like, this is amazing. Oh my gosh, this is everything I've wanted. Yeah. And I got to the final interview and they were like, culturally, you're a great fit. And as you, as you hear that, you're like, first off, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Cause that means I would work really well with the people. And that's really important, you know? Yeah. But you also know that something else is coming, which was you have no experience. And the other candidate has a computer science degree. And I was like, 
but you should know this from my CV and yeah. all the other application processes. So when I did stumble upon Kubrick and I found them through LinkedIn because they were, you might have to fact check me on this. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll like see if I've got the facts to have. The second fastest growing startup. Um, and I remember scrolling through and the top one I remember was was within the energy corporation, you know, the energy industry. And I was like, I don't necessarily know I want to work in that industry, yeah. but data consulting, I could work in any cons industry. That sounds great. Yeah. And so my application process, that was, you know, my idea was that they're gonna train me, I don't need experience. And I'm so glad that they were honestly one of the only companies that I know of that stuck to their word yeah. um, because, it's, it's, you know, people like myself and, you know, like Joe and anybody who wants to get into the industry, but feels like they can't purely because they've not had a door open. Yeah. It's knowing that there are opportunities available for you, whether you've not had the right education, whether you've come from a different background, you know, whether you've not worked in X amount of years. Yeah. The amount of times I hear people say, you've had, you've got a six month gap on your CV. Like, what were you doing there? You need to put something in that. Do you? Yeah. Like, it, it shouldn't be a bad thing that you took a time, you know, you took time out or that you couldn't find something at a certain time. That shouldn't be a bad thing. That, yeah. doesn't, that shouldn't stop you from doing a job, you know? That I just agree. means that you had six months out. Doesn't mean that you're less qualified in any sense. Absolutely. So, it's, it's almost like that that piece where if you take time away, take time for yourself, you could have been upskilling. You could exactly. have been doing things to get yourself up to that level. But yeah. it's, I think the main purpose of diversity and inclusion mm. is not taking things at face value and oh. having them tick boxes for certain purposes. 100%. You've got to understand people at that level. And I think, again, we're in, you know, with jobs and everything, it's difficult. People are looking for through thousands of CVs a day. I, I get it. But mm -hmm when we are discussing what makes a company move forward, it is such different perspectives on mm -hmm. projects. You know, I've, I've seen it happen where someone has a different idea. It's a bit out of the box. Nobody else has thought about it, but that is the thing because they've not been in a STEM, uh, come from a STEM background and their mind operates differently. They've been able to crack a problem where people who think in a certain way can't. So I think that's a really, really interesting yeah. point. Um, and even, you know, just what you were mentioning with the STEM background, even those with a STEM background, it's your personal experiences. Yeah. So every single experience really shapes you. And I find this all the time. Um, like when I write, when I write songs, I find that my, my subconscious or whatever you want to call it, but throughout all the different experiences I've had, are what kind of shaped me to make the lyrics. And I sometimes I sit there and I'm like, where did that come from? But mm. I think, you know, that works in a similar way with ideas at work. And even when you said about CVs, there is, oh, I hate to bring up Love Island, but <laughs> I haven't actually watched Love Island in like a few years, but- <laughs> Let's really segue. Let's really go that way. But you know that phrase where it's, oh, um, match on paper or something like, you're perfect paper match, yeah. but in person you're not. Yeah. That's so true though. Like yeah. the work, honestly, because you, I upskilled, right? So I taught myself X amount of Python, X amount of Swift and a bit of SQL before even joining Kubrick. And that was because I wanted those skills. When I applied for all these companies, they loved that, but they said, you don't actually have a degree in it though. Yeah. And I was like, but I can do what you're asking. And they said, well, it, on paper, you don't, you don't yeah. have that skill. Companies need to stop that. Like, honestly, if you can prove yourself, I passed the coding assessments. Yeah. What do you want? What more do you yeah. like? What no, do no, you no, no, I, I understand that. That's, that is quite off, off putting to people who are trying to get into a new industry. Yeah. Where it just, I think something that seems, you know, I think we said this in the first po podcast in, from a diversity perspective, if something seems really unattainable, people have a predispensed notion to not push for it because yeah. they think it's out of their reach. It's lowering that mm. um you know aspect of it and saying actually things are all in reach you can now there's tons of resources available um you know people are encouraging this sort of diverse perspective um really finally i want to find out from both of you individually since we're talking about your individual journeys um <laughs> what do you what do you see as your your next step for your future it's a great question. The, <laughs> you you have never told me that I've had such good questions in my entire friendship with you. So this, very is, true. this is so brilliant for me. Um, I think, I think now that I've, I've worked for Kubrick, um, for just over two years, um, and I'm sort of getting more and more involved in, in a lot of the sort of strategy side, mm -hmm. it's, uh, from my perspective, it's, it's sort of baking these kind of conversations into not just this the sort of high level. The key principles are really important and being able to sort of 
bring those down mm. into the ways of working into into how we operate and how we how we engage with each people uh, each team and each group etc mm. is really important to me um and so and 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 sort of being that voice across not just you know our, our team the client team but also across the whole business and being able to go you know uh, let, let's talk about how we hire yeah. let's talk about how hr interact with consultants let's talk about how we as a client team should be pushing for mm-hmm. How, how do we talk about diversity to clients? Because that's a huge conversation. Yeah. Um, how do we, you know, how do we engage with people on, um, on on certain things? How do we shift from bias that we have to mm. just evidence-led approach? Yeah. Because that's, you know, that's the solution. And that's yeah. how, we're, that's how, uh, yeah, that's where I want to take. Wow. Well, next, I next mean, if any, if anyone could do it, I still remember just a very, very quick anecdote. <sighs> I, uh, I started and Joe was actually my manager for a very interim period. And, Best manager. Oh my best gosh. manager. Sorry, Nick Allen. Really um, <laughs> uh, no, well, I, I mean, if anyone, <laughs> uh, if, <laughs> if anyone can do that, I know it's you. So I think that it, it's really good to have someone that you can, like the way you speak with such conviction about it, that's what you need. You don't need the lip service of let's do this for doing its sake because mm. we have to make sure that we're, we're being perceived in a certain way. People who actually really want to champion that cause and really want to move a company forward i think that's the way to do it so definitely watch this space joe woodman coming at you in the next uh next year with some excellent strategy decisions um so i know you're you're very early into <laughs> your your um journey as a consultant on client site so i won't push you too hard on what your next move is but are there any sort of bigger picture ideas especially to do with diversity and inclusion that you you'd like to push forward or be a part of Well, I think personally for me, I just, I want to continue my self-development and I think I'm really lucky I'm in a really great position because I can see that happening for the next two years, you know, being given those opportunities. Um, But I mean, I'm going back potentially to my old high school (laughs) to literally just talk about where I'm at because, you know, again, engineering school don't really have anything to do with data or tech at the moment. And I'm, I'm there like, I think you should, I think you're missing out of it. Um, to kind of, you know, just encourage young, I, my school was a girls school, but young, encourage young girls, encourage young people in general to look at the industries that they want to go into. Because, you know, you hear about the finance industry and then you hear like, oh, you can go to banking, you can go into, you know, insurance. There's mm-hmm. different pathways. You hear about the technology industry and only recently really are you hearing about data right before it was just technology and I think kind of encouraging people from all backgrounds yeah. to research and understand that there are so many different pathways and avenues within technology mm-hmm. and it really is the space to be in um and I think hopefully through that there will be a lot more diversity coming in um, that's amazing that's but yeah really good. if company if companies can include it more in yeah in their, in their HR systems I think but that's that's yeah. brilliant that you're going back to your your school to yeah. talk about it that's no, amazing it'll be really nice I mean all you know COVID permitting I might have to do a zoom but yeah okay. <laughs> I can't I, another zoom quiz this Christmas would send me over the edge oh my god I, I don't know if I can I can champion that but I'm very <laughs> buzzword <laughs> um no but I am I'm really really happy to have had both of you on, I think you give such great overviews from an individual perspective, but also also ones that I think people who are listening and who are Kubrick consultants currently can can take on board and see that there are different avenues, not just now, but in the future as well. Um, mm. And finally, I, do, I would like to say if anyone would like to reach out to uh, Joe and Sonal, I'll just let them kind of give an intro into where they can find you. Oh, is this like a, a plug thing? Like a LinkedIn oh, thing if you've yeah. got, if you I both do have, have LinkedIn. I have a LinkedIn. Brilliant. Yeah, it is my name. <laughs> um, Sonal Sethi. Brilliant. I don't know if you're going to put it there or... We'll, but, we'll figure know. out a way to make it very funky. We have there an excellent is. content creator. And uh, Joe? Yeah, same LinkedIn for me. Uh, always happy to to sort of take messages and, and conversations. I, I, uh, yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, thank you both for coming on. Um, I hope this has been uh, helpful for a lot of people who are looking to get into the industry or just want to tune in. And and if you're passionate about diversity and inclusion, we are too. So thanks for joining us. And um, yeah, we'll be back with another episode. So stay tuned, everyone.